Anesthesia Rounds, a series of discussions of clinical problems confronting the anesthesiologist. Anesthesia Rounds is presented as a service to clinicians in the field of anesthesiology by Erst Laboratories. In this interview, Dr. Stanley Deutsch, Associate in Surgery, Division of Anesthesia at Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston and Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology at Harvard Medical School, will discuss changes in the renal fluid balance before, during, and after surgery. Dr. Deutsch will also discuss those aspects of renal physiology that most concern the practicing anesthesiologist, factors that control formation and tubular alteration of the glomerular ultrafiltrate. He will also consider glomerular filtration rate, measurement of the RBF and GFR, effects of general and regional anesthesia on water and electrolyte excretion, and mechanisms by which they are accomplished. Dr. Deutsch, in considering the effects of anesthetics on kidney function, which aspects of renal physiology do you regard as most important for the practicing anesthesiologist? I would say filtration of plasma through the glomeruli and alteration of the glomerular filtrate by the tubules. By these means, the kidney plays a vital role in maintaining homeostasis of the internal environment. What renal mechanisms or factors regulate water and salt excretion? Their excretion is regulated by the quantity of blood that the kidney has received each minute, the rate of glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption and secretion of electrolytes, and water reabsorption by the kidney tubules. Which major factors control renal blood flow? Under resting conditions in the supine position, the main determinant of renal plasma flow is the relative tone of the afferent and efferent arterioles of the kidney. By means of an internal mechanism which is not yet well understood, the kidney can auto-regulate its blood flow and glomerular filtration rate so that within a range of arterial pressures between 80 and 180 millimeters of mercury, glomerular filtration rate and renal blood flow are maintained relatively constant. Superimposed upon this intrinsic mechanism are the effects of sympathetic innervation of the renal vessels. Dr. Deutsch, would you characterize the role of the sympathetic nervous system in determining the glomerular filtration rate? Activation of sympathetic nerves results in vasoconstriction, thereby increasing vascular resistance within the kidney. When a patient is at rest in the supine position, there is little activity of the vasoconstrictor nerves to the kidney. However, with fear, pain, syncope, exercise, hemorrhage, and other emergencies, both renal blood flow and filtration rate are sacrificed to preserve blood flow to the brain and heart. Many drugs employed clinically result in a marked reduction of renal blood flow. All the vasoconstrictors that have been studied have been shown to reduce renal blood flow. Pyrogen is the only known compound that consistently increases renal blood flow. Dr. Deutsch, what other clinical factors affect renal blood flow? The general anesthetics also have profound effects on renal hemodynamics, as we shall see. In addition, continuous positive pressure applied to the airways results in marked reduction in renal hemodynamics and water and electrolyte excretion. What is the normal rate of renal blood flow and how is it usually measured clinically? Normal renal blood flow is approximately 1200 milliliters per minute or about one-fourth of the cardiac output. Renal blood flow is generally measured by determining the clearance of paraaminohypurate, or PAH, from the plasma, a technique based on the Fick principle. PAH is completely cleared by the kidney. It is infused at a constant rate following the administration of a priming dose. Thereafter, urine and blood are collected at carefully timed intervals to determine their PAH concentration. Now, how are the findings evaluated? Knowing the rate of urine volume excretion, one can determine the effective renal plasma flow. With the hematocrit, 
renal plasma flow can be converted to renal blood flow. Because PAH is secreted by the proximal tubules of the kidney and to a very slight extent filtered through the glomeruli, one is measuring flow through the cortex of the kidney. And this is normally 90% of the total renal blood flow. And what about the remaining 10%? This is assumed to supply the non-actively secreting areas of the kidney, the capsule, pelvis, and perirenal fat. Recently, radioactive tag compounds handled like PAH have been employed in the measurement of renal blood flow. By determining the clearance of the radioactive tag from plasma, one can obviate the need for urine collection. Dr. Deutsch, what are the relative changes in the GFR with rise and fall in arterial pressure, and why does the change have the magnitude it has? The main determinants of glomerular filtration rate are balanced between the arterial pressure at which blood is presented to the kidney and the resistance within the afferent and efferent arterioles. Changes in intracapillary hydrostatic pressure may result from either a change in arterial pressure or a change in afferent or efferent arteriolar tone. Constriction of the afferent arteriole reduces glomerular capillary pressure, while dilation permits the capillary pressure to approach that of the aorta. Constriction of the efferent arteriole increases the glomerular capillary pressure and filtration rate. Dilation of the efferent arteriole reduces the filtration rate and glomerular capillary pressure. As mentioned previously, vascular resistance within the kidney may be altered by increased sympathetic activity and by intrinsic autoregulatory activity of the kidney. What other factors affect glomerular filtration? These include glomerular membrane permeability, colloid osmotic pressure of the plasma, and the intracapsular hydrostatic pressure within the kidney. Glomerular filtration rate is measured by the determination of inulin clearance and is normally about 125 ml per minute in men and 10% lower in women. Of the 180 liters of fluid filtered through the glomeruli, Normally, only one to two liters of urine are excreted each day. Tubular reabsorption is an extremely complex activity involving passive and active transport of water and electrolytes. Dr. Deutsch, would you now describe the relationship between arterial pressure, the RBF, and the GFR? Within the range of 80 to 180 millimeters of mercury, the autoregulatory mechanisms of the kidney will maintain the GFR and the effective renal plasma flow, the portion of the flow in the actively secreting areas of the kidney, at a relatively constant level. And the relative effects on the GFR and the plasma flow with greater changes in arterial pressure? Under most conditions, the effects are fairly parallel. But under conditions of stress, the kidney apparently acts to maintain the GFR. Under stress, one will frequently see greater reductions in renal plasma flow than in GFR, because the efferent arteriolar constriction that takes place tends to maintain increased glomerular capillary pressure. Dr. Deutsch, what are the major factors that control tubular reabsorption? Tubular reabsorption is an extremely complex activity involving passive and active transport of water, electrolytes, and the many other constituents of the plasma ultrafiltrate. It is also concerned with the action of a number of hormones. One is antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, liberated from the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary, and another is aldosterone, liberated from the adrenal cortex. And what role do these hormones play in the formation of urine? Urine is concentrated through the process of countercurrent multiplication. Most of the water and electrolytes are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule and in Henle's loop. Under the influence of aldosterone, sodium is reabsorbed 
and potassium is secreted in the distal tubule, while the reabsorption of water in the distal and collecting tubules is largely under the control of ADH. In the presence of ADH, the distal and collecting tubules become permeable to water, resulting in a concentrated urine of relatively small volume. Dr. Deutsch, would you elucidate the general pattern of the countercurrent mechanism as it is presently understood? The current concept involves the maintenance of a gradient of osmolality from the cortex to the medulla, the cortex having an osmolality very close to that of plasma, roughly 300 milliosmoles per kilogram. As the ultrafiltrate reaches the tip of the medullary papillae, the concentration is about 1,200 milliosmoles per kilogram of water. This gradient of osmolality is for both sodium and urea, which are deposited within the interstitium of the kidney. And Dr. Deutsch, what mechanisms explain the gradient? The basis for this gradient of osmolality is that the ascending loop of Henle is permeable to sodium and urea, but not to water. With reference to sodium, the ascending limb actively pumps the solute into the interstitium, reducing its concentration in the tubule and increasing it in the tissue spaces. The filtrate in the descending limb by absorbing the solute while losing water to the interstitium on the basis of the latter's hypertonicity becomes more concentrated, its sodium concentration being equivalent to that of the interstitial fluid at the same level. Dr. Deutsch, what is the general effect on the filtrate of passage through the loop of Henle? It discharges into the distal tubules at a reduced osmolality and a greatly reduced volume, perhaps 15% of the glomerular filtrate volume. What happens to the excess water and sodium? They are removed by the circulation. Since the osmolality of the tubular load is reduced by passage through the loop of Henle, from about 300 to 100 milliosmoles per kilogram after having reached about 1200 milliosmoles per kilogram at the hairpin turn of the loop. Well, the purpose of the mechanism would appear to be to maintain the interstitial fluid at the gradient you've just mentioned? Yes, concentration occurs in the collecting duct. All right, Dr. Deutsch, now speaking teleologically, what then would be the functional purpose of the countercurrent mechanism? It is concentration of urine. Consider the species that live in the desert. The kangaroo rat is an excellent example. It puts out almost no urine. In fact, it's a paste that contains all the waste products. This is one animal that really has to conserve water living in the desert. Its loop of Henle is huge. All animals that can concentrate urine have loops of Henle. Also, in the absence of ADH, large volumes of dilute urine are excreted. And how is this accomplished, Dr. Deutsch? Once it reaches the distal tubules and the collecting tubules, the reduced amount of ultrafiltrate will either pass into the urine or be reabsorbed, depending on the presence of ADH. If ADH is present, there is reabsorption of water, already present in relatively small amounts so that you have a very small volume of very concentrated urine. ADH is stimulated by dehydration, low blood volume, and a number of other stimuli, drugs and anesthetics. Dr. Deutsch, the presence of ADH permits water to leave the collecting tubule, but what drives it into the interstitium? The osmolar gradient established in the interstitium by the countercurrent mechanism. And how can one characterize the effects of general anesthetics on renal hemodynamics? All the general anesthetics studied to date have been observed to produce significant reductions in glomerular filtration rate and renal plasma flow. These findings have been obtained in subjects without kidney disease. None had hemorrhage, acidosis, operative stimuli such as pain, packs and retractors, and all had normal oxygenation and alveolar ventilation. Under steady state conditions of anesthetic concentration, inulin and PAH, 
and with urine volumes of 2 ml per minute or greater in order to allow the valid application of clearance techniques, halothane in a concentration of 1.5% inspired results in a 19% reduction of the GFR and a 38% reduction in effective renal plasma flow. The filtration fraction, therefore, is increased even though the clearance is reduced. The ratio of inulin to PAH clearance, or filtration fraction, is increased 39%, suggesting efferent arteriolar vasoconstriction. And if renal vascular resistance is calculated, it is seen that this again is increased significantly. Under similar conditions, cyclopropane in a concentration of 18 volumes per cent end expired level produces a 39% reduction in the GFR and a 42% reduction in effective renal plasma flow. Renal vascular resistance is also significantly increased during cyclopropane anesthesia. What data are there concerning pre-anesthetic medication? These drugs, namely pentobarbital, morphine, and meperidine, along with atropine, produce small reductions in GFR, about 13%, and a reduction in effective renal plasma flow of about 9%. If one superimposes thiopental, nitrous oxide, neuromuscular blocking drugs, and more narcotic, as is normally practiced with the so-called nitrous relaxant technique, a further decrease of about 10% in GFR and a 34% reduction in renal plasma flow are observed. Renal vascular resistance is also increased about 30%. Similar results have recently been reported with the combination of Innovar and nitrous oxide anesthesia. Diethylether has also been reported to result in similar reductions in renal hemodynamics and excretion of water and electrolytes. Dr. Deutsch, what is known or postulated concerning the mechanisms that accomplish these effects? They are related to a combination of the general hemodynamic action of the anesthetics and are also, we believe, to some extent on the mechanisms that normally act to autoregulate blood flow in the kidneys. Cyclopropane is known to be associated with an increased sympathetic nervous activity so that one would expect increased vascular resistance in the kidney to result from its administration. Efferent arteriolar tone is apparently increased more than afferent arteriolar tone in an attempt to preserve the GFR. Dr. Deutsch, is this effect always neural in origin? Halothane is not known to be associated with increased sympathetic nervous activity and has even been demonstrated to reduce the effect of catecholamines on smooth muscle of blood vessel walls. The kidney is the only area I know that has an increased vascular resistance during halothane anesthesia. In all other areas of circulation, including the cerebral, splanchnic, and peripheral areas, Halothane produces either vasodilation or no change in vascular resistance. We have some evidence that during cyclopropane and halothane anesthesia, there is an increase in circulating plasma renin. And Dr. Deutsch, what mechanism is postulated here? Renin is liberated from the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney. It is an enzyme that acts upon a precursor of angiotensin to form first angiotensin 1, then angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2, a very potent vasopressor. The renin angiotensin system is believed by some to play an important role in autoregulation of blood flow in the kidney. Renin liberation and angiotensin formation could result in vasoconstriction within the kidney. This could explain, in part, the hemodynamic changes observed with cyclopropane and halothane anesthesia. Is there any relationship between this mechanism and the adrenal cortical effects on reabsorption of sodium? That is possible. We know that aldosterone is also liberated during general anesthesia, 
and could be related to the renin-angiotensin mechanism. Have these effects been noted concurrently? I do not know that anyone has studied aldosterone secretory rates during anesthesia. Such a study is being considered here at Harvard. What effects then, Dr. Deutsch, do general anesthetics have on the ultimate urinary output of water and electrolyte? All the general anesthetics commonly employed clinically result in marked reduction in water and electrolyte excretion. In well hydrated subjects with good water diuresis, induction of anesthesia results in a marked reduction in urine volume, an increase in osmolality of the urine, and conversion of a positive free water clearance, indicative of a very dilute urine, to a negative free water clearance, indicative of a very concentrated urine. Osmolar clearance, sodium and potassium excretion are also significantly reduced with general anesthesia. Dr. Deutsch, what are the various postulated mechanisms by which general anesthetics alter water and electrolyte excretion? The reduction in the GFR during anesthesia may explain in part the reduction in osmolar clearance, sodium, and potassium excretion. If less electrolyte is filtered, one would expect less to appear in the urine. Another important factor in the reduction of urine volume and in the concentration of urine is the liberation of ADH during anesthesia. If ethanol, a known inhibitor of ADH release, is infused during general anesthesia, one may partially reverse the antidiuresis observed during general anesthesia. What is postulated concerning the reason for ADH release? It is probably related to a CNS effect of general anesthetics. ADH is produced within certain small areas of the hypothalamus and then passes to the posterior pituitary where it is concentrated. Under conditions of fright, hemorrhage, many, many stimuli, drugs, anesthetics, ADH is liberated and results in a concentrated urine. Aldosterone liberation during anesthesia may also play a role in the reduction of sodium excretion observed during general anesthesia. Dr. Deutsch, is anything known concerning the effects of anesthesia on tubular secretion or reabsorption? I don't think anyone really knows what these effects are. Certainly, when considering the GFR, you'd think of less plasma being filtered and you'd expect less of each filterable substance to appear in the urine. Anesthesia certainly doesn't appear to alter the act of transport within the kidney. If anything, sodium is reabsorbed in increased amounts. It's not as if you're producing a saline diuresis. So far as we know, none of the really vital mechanisms, the intrinsic mechanisms by which tubules handle filtered substances is altered. Tubular secretion of PAH wasn't altered at all in our study of halothane. Dr. Deutsch, what are the effects of regional anesthesia on renal function? Little is known about the effects of regional anesthesia on renal function. The few clinical studies reported indicate that provided the mean arterial pressure is maintained, there is only a slight reduction in renal plasma flow and GFR with spinal anesthesia. In the presence of significant hypotension, however, there are profound reductions in these functions. Much more work remains to be carried out in these areas. For example, in the sympathectomized kidney in man, are the autoregulatory systems functioning to preserve glomerular filtration? Not much is known about this. We are now actively studying regional anesthesia and renal function. There have been just two studies one is useless, and I've summarized the other. Now, Dr. Deutsch, how do these observations on the effects of anesthesia on kidney function apply to the care of a patient with normal kidney function? As far as we know, the effects of general anesthetics on renal hemodynamics and water and electrolyte excretion in patients without renal disease are completely reversible. 
However, the changes produced during general anesthesia when superimposed upon the many other factors associated with surgical procedures may lead to problems during and after surgery. Normally, patients have fluid withheld for 12 to 15 hours prior to anesthesia and surgery so that they are excreting small volumes of very concentrated urine prior to anesthesia induction. With the induction of anesthesia, the ADH release is augmented. The marked antidiuresis observed during anesthesia and operation is further aggravated by ADH release as a result of surgical stimulation and pain in the post-operative period and may result in a sustained antidiuresis in the post-operative period. Dr. Deutsch, what would you say might be the clinical effects of sustained antidiuresis? Certain patients, particularly in the geriatric group, may retain water and develop symptomatic hyponatremia with signs of cerebral edema, including confusion, restlessness, coma, and convulsions. The antidiuresis associated with anesthesia and surgery represents a potential hazard if a hemolytic transfusion reaction occurs during the operation. There is good evidence that the morbidity and mortality from such a reaction can be reduced if it occurs during a diuresis instead of a period of antidiuresis. One assumes that the hemoglobin pigment is washed out of the kidney tubules during the diuresis and does not block the tubules and set the stage for the development of acute tubular necrosis. Similarly, if hemorrhage occurs during anesthesia, one can conceive of a further reduction in renal blood flow and possibly more permanent alterations in renal function. Hypovolemia in the pre-anesthetic period may set the stage for intra- and post-operative renal function depression. Anoxia, respiratory, and metabolic acidosis also may be factors in alteration of renal function. Dr. Deutsch, what might be the mechanisms with acidosis? Acidosis, apparently, is frequently accompanied by sympathetic activity and changes in renal vascular resistance, and it probably produces depression of tubule function. The effects of acidosis on renal function have not been well studied in man. The relationship is probably to the general hemodynamic effects of acidosis. We are beginning to give more consideration to renal function during anesthesia and operation. Hydration with so-called balanced salt solutions is being carried out to maintain urine volume output during anesthesia and operation. Osmotic diuretics such as mannitol are being used for this purpose. What are the renal effects associated with prolonged major surgery? One instinctively feels that increasing duration of anesthesia and surgical procedure should be associated with more prolonged depression of renal function, but no data are available on this point. As for severity of the operation, without question both temporary and permanent changes in renal function are associated with such major procedures as resection and grafting of the abdominal aorta and cardiac procedures involving the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. Prolonged post-operative antidiuresis is associated with the degree of surgical trauma, hemorrhage, hypotension, and the severity of the operative procedure. It has also been associated with the prolonged release of ADH in the post-operative period. Now, what might be done preoperatively in the way of evaluating the procedure and the kidney function? I think that today we're certainly much more concerned with these factors than we once were, particularly in such operations as abdominal aortic aneurysm and the procedures incorporating cardiopulmonary bypass. We're much more conscious of what's going on during the operation, although all that one can really monitor is the amount of urine that is being produced. 
More people are beginning to feel that these patients should routinely be given volumes of so-called balanced salt solutions, Ringer's lactate, for example, so that they are well hydrated, are not in an antidiuretic state before they receive their anesthetic, so they're excreting good volumes of urine. Apparently, there is much less depression of some of the renal functions with a sustained urine volume output. Dr. Deutsch, what procedures can be used, even hypothetically, for monitoring renal function during such procedures? Only a measurement of the amount of urine excreted and a determination of its constituents. Is this done during surgery? Yes, frequently. Through catheterization? Yes, you can catheterize the urinary bladder. We do it most often when people are going to have multiple transfusions, major procedures that might require large transfusions because we fear the hemolytic transfusion reaction that results in hemoglobin getting out into the tubules, plugging them, and setting in motion the development of acute tubular necrosis. If you can keep the tubules washed out, you can reduce the incidence of permanent renal damage. And this derives from the hemoglobinuria that is associated with the transfusion reaction? Yes, and most patients on pump oxygenator have fairly large amounts of hemoglobin being presented to the kidneys because the pump oxygenator traumatizes the blood quite a bit. These people have an especially high incidence of renal complications as well as other complications in the post-operative period. Actually, we're now studying a large group before and during cardiopulmonary bypass to determine which anesthetics are associated with more depression during an operation such as this. What factors associated with cardiopulmonary bypass might be associated with renal complications, such as acid-base imbalance? Whether the diuretics, such as mannitol, whether some of the drugs, such as ethacrinic acid and others used routinely in these patients, affect renal function. We're following patients pre, intra, and post-operatively, studying the hemodynamics and water and electrolyte excretion. Are there any other criteria in the immediate post-operative period that would be useful to indicate that there had been or might be kidney dysfunction? There are certain enzymes that appear in the urine when there has been, say, rejection of a transplanted kidney. We're now going to start looking at these during anesthesia and operation. Perhaps we can, by studying some of these enzymes, determine whether their appearance signifies some renal insult. They may provide a clue to renal cell damage, such as SGOT provides with respect to myocardial cell or hepatic cell damage. Now, Dr. Deutsch, how do these factors and what is known about anesthetics and renal function apply to the patient with diseased kidneys? Now, I know this is a question that the literature is of little help in answering. That's right. This is an area about which we have no concrete data. Patients with renal disease not infrequently have serious problems related to their already compromised renal function in the post-operative period. What role anesthetics play in this deterioration remains to be determined. When possible, regional anesthetics, which appear to have fewer depressant effects than many general anesthetics, would appear to be useful. That's all we really know about this area. What is done now, Dr. Deutsch, with respect to the provision of anesthesia in various kidney diseases? If there is an inflammatory disease, does it make any difference, for example, whether it's pyelonephritis or glomerulonephritis or nephrosclerosis? Well, patients with arteriolar disease, nephrosclerosis or glomerulonephritis, generally have hypertension too. And in general, we try to avoid cyclopropane or other agents that produce further increase in the blood pressure. You are concerned with the systemic effects of these disorders? Yes. Certainly, I think the key to less depressant effect on any organ is light general anesthesia, if a general anesthetic must be used. 
Otherwise, when this is a concern, a regional anesthetic can be employed. If I had to use general anesthesia, I would use an agent such as halothane, nitrous, narcotic, and relaxants that do not produce much in the way of cardiovascular depression and also probably less renal depression. I would think that degree of depression of the kidneys is related to depth of anesthesia. Dr. Deutsch, would you use the general agent in conjunction with muscle relaxants for potentiation of its effect? Yes, but in someone who has kidney disease, one would avoid muscle relaxants, such as galamine, that require the kidney for their excretion. So you might turn to succinylcholine. Or detubocurine. I would also tend to use less succinylcholine with these people because they do have altered plasma cholinesterase. Now, Dr. Deutsch, what does the future hold in this area we've been discussing, anesthesia and its effects on kidney function? Well, with empirical knowledge concerning the effects of anesthetics on the normal kidney, and with some understanding of some of the mechanisms involved, the important questions of what anesthetics do in the presence of kidney disease and during major thoracic and abdominal procedures are being approached. A good deal more work regarding the effects on renal function of vasopressors, blood volume alterations, changes in acid-base balance, and diuretics and other drugs commonly employed during anesthesia and surgery also remains to be done. And Dr. Deutsch, at present, which of these areas are being investigated? Other groups have studied spinal anesthesia in the presence of hypertension and hypotension. We've primarily been studying people with good renal function who are not to undergo surgery. Certainly, in the factors associated with dehydration in the preoperative period, pre-anesthetic drugs, operative stimuli, PACs, retractors, hemorrhage, all these factors can really complicate a study. I think we should know what the relevant anesthetics can do with respect to renal function after we've finished our studies of spinal anesthesia. The effects of epidural anesthesia should be essentially the same. We'll know the effects of the three most commonly used general anesthetics, cyclopropane, halothane, nitrous oxide and of the agents used in the most commonly employed regional technique, spinal anesthesia. With that as a background, we can use the knowledge gained from our studies on renin and angiotensin to form a better idea of how to approach people with kidney disease, those who are going to have their abdominal aortas replaced, valves replaced in their hearts, and we'll know more precisely the effects of vasopressors, plasma expanders, and many other factors frequently associated with operation. Dr. Deutsch, thank you very much. Anesthesia Rounds is presented as a service to clinicians in the field of anesthesiology by Ayrst Laboratories.